war, destruction, conflict, crisis, ruin, devastation, and perhaps even terrorism. I'm absolutely sure that this is the mental image that most of you have about this corner of the world. Israel's blockade of Gaza causes losses of 14 billion euros between 2007 and 2018, according to the UN, Europa Press. February 2021, UN report. Palestinian socio-economic development suffers one of its worst years since 1994, Relief Web. 21st of May 2021, Israel and Hamas agree a ceasefire after 11 days of fighting. Conflict has claimed lives of at least 230 Palestinians and 12 Israelis. The Financial Times. But the first thing to be clear on is what exactly we are talking about. Geographically, we could say that Palestine is the territory currently comprised of Jordan, Israel, and of course, the Palestinian National Authority, also recognized as a Palestinian state by the UN and many governments around the world. There are also those who consider that Palestine is simply the territory that today is bordered by Israel, the West Bank and Gaza, and others who limit it in practice to only the current West Bank and Gaza. In any case, this is visual politic. So the question we are most interested in is not so much geographic nor semantic, but above all, political politics with real implications. Specifically, in this video, we are going to deal with the semi-recognized state of Palestine, and that is exactly what we will be referring to as Palestine throughout this video. So, who is in charge? How is it organized? How effective is this state really? On this occasion, we will try not to talk to you too much about history, at least not as much as we usually do, nor about wars. We'll even try to avoid even talking about Israel, except when there's no other choice. No, this time we want to get to know the Palestine that is beyond the headlines and the catastrophic news. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, let's Let's get started. Two conflicts for the price of one. Palestine, a territorial, political, and social entity in which five million people live together. Of course, this is the theory. In practice, we can't talk of a single Palestine, but really of two. Basically, there are the Palestinians of the West Bank and the Palestinians of the Gaza Strip. And you can believe me when I tell you that, at least politically, they don't see eye to eye at all. In fact, Israel is not the only open conflict in Palestine. And that, that's what explains why we come across news like this from time to time. 13th of June 2007. Civil war breaks out in Gaza between Palestinian factions. El Pais. We are talking about a conflict that goes way back. The two historic Palestinian leaders, Ahmed Yassin, co-founder and political and religious leader of the Hamas movement, and the mythical Yasser Arafat, the founder of the Fatah political party and the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, didn't get along at all. So much so that at the end of the 20th century, you could read headlines like this one. Hamas leader put under house arrest, the also Press. The unprecedented move against Sheikh Ahmed Yassin came after Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat promised to crack down on the militants in response to the attack, which threatened to undermine the new Middle East peace agreement. The attack referred to in the news item was not against Palestine, but against Israel. Hold up, wait a minute please. One Palestinian leader was arresting another for attacking Israel. Yes, that is correct. And the fact is that whilst the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, agreed to conclude peace agreements with Israel, Hamas, an anti-Zionist and jihadist organization, considered and still considers the idea intolerable. For them, the recognition of the Jewish state is something like a red line that they're not willing to cross. And in fact, in addition to the typical proxy war that always occurs between warring factions, this point, this red line of reaching peace with Israel or not, is the fundamental basis that justifies all the major political divisions in Palestine. Among them, the most important one is the fact that, in practice, this semi-state is currently divided into two territories with very different governments, which are also in direct confrontation with each other. You see, both Palestinian factions consider Israel to be an occupying power, yes, but they do not agree on how to deal with their relationship with the Hebrew state, nor on the roadmap and the direction of a future independent Palestinian state should take. This is largely to blame for the abrupt social and political divisions suffered by this territory. On the one hand, there is the Fatah Party, which controls the West Bank area and presides over the Palestinian National Authority, which is the body recognized as a state by the UN and quite a few countries in the world. And on the other side, there is Hamas, the terror group that rules in the Gaza Strip, a group which we've talked a lot about on Visual Politic. You know, the guys who like to launch rockets against Israel and export terrorists? This is an important issue. Both factions have evolved over time, and today represent very different understandings of both the Arab-Israeli conflict and the Palestinian state model. 
For example, while a fairly strict version of Islamic law called Sharia is applied in Gaza, with physical punishment and summary executions being relatively frequent, in the West Bank of the Palestinian National Authority, such things are non-existent, or at least very minimal. What's more, the PNA works openly on political and security matters with the Israeli government, while in Gaza, the situation is one of open and direct warfare against the Jews. Of course, the division in Palestine today has been the result of a constant succession of conflicts, divisions, and failed agreements whose fine print could give anyone a headache. So now that we are aware of the deep division that plagues this semi-state, let's get straight to the key question. How exactly does Palestine function today? Listen up. A land a hundred times divided. Referring to Palestine as the land a hundred times divided is not only a figure of speech, but in this case, fits quite well with reality. You see, territorially, one of the biggest problems in Palestine today is its complete lack of territorial cohesion, which makes the existence of an effective state capable of adequately managing and controlling the territory very complicated. Take a look at this map. In addition to the division of Palestine into the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, within the West Bank, the territory has been divided and redivided, albeit in a somewhat odd way. Why? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to the Oslo Accords of 1993. With these agreements, Israel and the Palestinian PLO put an end to their disputes and agreed on the creation of areas with different degrees of self-government and independence in the West Bank. Three categories were recognized, A, B, and C. In the type A areas, the Palestinians have civilian as well as military and security control. In type B areas, they have civilian control, but military control is shared between Palestine and Israel. And finally, type C areas Areas are areas of Palestine controlled civilly and militarily by Israel. In areas B and C, Israeli military control is exercised through the Israeli civil administration. The problem is that, despite the fact that in areas A and B, Palestinians have the highest degree of self-rule in their history, these agreements were seen by Hamas and some of the Palestinians as a surrender to Israel, as too great a concession in relation to the aspirations of the Palestinians to achieve an independent state. In fact, to this day, the West Bank is still administered in this way, with type A, B and C areas, which have no union and cohesion between them. For example, to go from a type A area to another type A area, you have to cross a type C area controlled by Israel. So you could say that in practice, the freedom of movement of Palestinians remain under Israeli control, who have countless military checkpoints scattered throughout the West Bank. This makes almost any trip an odyssey. Evidently, the idea in agreements was that control of the sea areas would be gradually ceded from Israel to the newly created Palestinian National Authority, but that has not yet happened. There is also the issue of settlements, which we have talked about previously on visual politics. The so-called settlements are newly built Jewish towns and villages, in some cases quite large in size, which are located on West Bank soil and have become one of the major stumbling blocks in achieving any definitive solution. Remember that we're talking about more than 700,000 Israeli citizens living in settlements in the middle of the West Bank who, to top it all off, are connected with the rest of Israel by roads controlled by Israeli security, roads that in many cases are only for Israelis and that contribute to further scarring and splitting of the Palestinian territory. In short, a veritable maze that is evidently generating a lot of frustration among the Palestinian people. After all, not even the West Bank is a compact entity where a relatively normal social and institutional life can exist. And that is not all. As we've already told you, the Palestinians themselves are divided because Gaza and the West Bank function in a totally unrelated way. In fact, it is much easier for a Palestinian from the West Bank to move around Israel than it is to go to Gaza. That's how bad the internal division in Palestine has become. But now, at this point, I'm sure what what many of you are wondering is, okay, okay, the division is clear, but what political system is in place in the Palestinian controlled areas of the West Bank? How is the economy doing? And at the same time, what on earth is going on in Gaza? Well, let's answer these questions. Listen up. Palestine Beyond the Headlines 
Let's get one thing straight. Today, Palestinian politics is in chaos. It's a resounding failure. So much so that no parliamentary elections have been called in Palestine since 2006. And that's quite a stretch. More than 15 years without voting, despite the fact that the political model supposedly requires voting. This has been mainly due to the internal Palestinian conflict between the two major factions, Fatah, which governs the Palestinian National Authority, and Hamas, which governs in Gaza. A conflict that reached its peak in 2007. In 2006, Fatah narrowly lost Palestinian elections to Hamas, which won 74 of the 132 seats in the Palestinian Legislative Council. But instead of ceding power, the parties ended up engaging in an internal conflict that ended with a short-lived unity government lasting only three months, and a subsequent military conflict in Gaza in 2007, which continued openly and directly until at least 2011. As a result of that conflict, Hamas kept Gaza for itself, and Fatah managed to retain the government in the West Bank. And that is precisely the situation that we find ourselves in today. Obviously, to get out of this mess, Palestinians would have to vote again, but the disagreements between the Palestinian factions have made it impossible to hold parliamentary elections time and time again. For example, parliamentary elections were scheduled for May 2021, but were postponed again due to the conflict between Hamas and Israel that took place between April and May. Conflict. Surprise, surprise. That suited Hamas very well to continue ruling in Gaza. Incidentally, the Palestinian presidential elections scheduled for 31st of July 2021 have also been postponed indefinitely. But let's not get sidetracked. Now that we know how things stand, what political system exists in Palestine? Well, it's basically a semi-presidential republic. That is, power is shared between a legislative body, the Palestinian Legislative Council, and an executive body consisting of the president and the prime minister. Mahmoud Abbas has been the president for no less than 16 years. His office is supposed to be elected in presidential elections every four years, but the fact that no presidential elections have been held in Palestine since 2006. Then there is also the prime minister, who is is elected by the president and ratified by the parliament. In this case, the prime minister is in control of the government, while the president is the head of the state and does not have, at least on paper, as much power in ordinary government decisions. Another curiosity is that the Palestinian National Authority, or the semi-recognized state of Palestine created in 2013, has no constitution. So, Palestine is governed by a basic law created in 2002 by Yasser Arafat that is also applied in Gaza de jure, but not de facto. This basic law establishes such things as Islamic law, or Sharia, as the guiding principle of law in Palestine, or the membership of the Palestinian state in the Arab world as a whole. It is also established that its capital is Jerusalem, a city that the PNA controls the eastern side of, while the west belongs to Israel. In the case of Jerusalem, by the way, as you know, both sides, Israel and Palestine, recognize it as their capital. Although in practice, Tel Aviv in Israel and Ramallah in Palestine are the two most influential urban centers for each territory. In general, although the basic law recognizes Islam as the official religion, Palestinians in the West Bank live under a secular regime, where at least limited civil liberties and certain human rights are guaranteed. In contrast, in the case of Gaza, Hamas maintains a government headed by Ismail Haniyeh, which applies a strict version of Sharia law and does not respect the most basic civil liberties, religious plurality, or human rights. In fact, under the Hamas government in Gaza, harsh punishments are frequent, and there have even been execution of women and homosexuals for ethical and moral reasons, something that has been repeatedly denounced by various human rights organizations, but is usually overlooked by journalists. <clears throat> but now that we know about their political system, what about their economy? What on earth does Palestine live on? Well, the truth is that Palestine, at least the West Bank part, is not as poor as you might think at first. <laughs> This is due, in no small part, to their growing economic ties with Israel. Every day, thousands and thousands of Palestinians go to work in Israel, which allows them to bring home a higher wage. There are also many Palestinian immigrants working in Israel. In fact, between 15 and 40% of the entire Palestinian labor force has worked in Israel at some point in their lives during the last 50 years. It should also be noted that in the West Bank, the official currency is the Israeli New Shekel, so there is no problems with currency exchange. This also means that about 60% of all goods and products imported and exported by Palestine go to Israel. Yes, that's right. Israel is by far Palestine's largest trading partner. 
So, you know, to those who favor BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, maybe you had not noticed. But with all that, you are also hurting the Palestinian economy. Sometimes things are not as straightforward as we think, are they? But okay, despite all this, the reality is that today, the GDP per capita of the Palestinians is 11 times lower than that of Israel. And while the Palestinians bear the bulk of the responsibility for that situation, it is undeniable that the obstacles, the endless checkpoints, and the division of the territory that restricts and makes movement more expensive, while virtually preventing the effective functioning of local institutions, also have a lot to do with it. However, if we compare the West Bank's economy with that of other Muslim countries, the figures are not so bad either. In fact, the GDP per capita in the West Bank is similar to that of countries such as Morocco and Tunisia, two of the most advanced countries in the Islamic world. So things are not as bad as they are portrayed. However, international aid and cooperation are a very important source of income for the Palestinian government, which then uses these resources to pay for public services and aid to businesses. This is a very particular characteristic of this semi-state. But then there is also trade in services, fast becoming one of the most promising sectors, which is also driving new sectors such as high tech and software taking advantage of the proximity and expertise of Israelis in this field, and also, before the coronavirus, tourism. In fact, it is easy to find plenty of accommodation on Airbnb. Yes, those opportunities are starting to take hold in the West Bank. It is a completely different scenario than in Gaza, a territory that basically lives on money transfers from countries like Qatar. Anyway, this is the political and economic reality of Palestine, two very different Palestines, both with many problems, but one of them much more promising than the other. Having said that, it's your turn. Do you think Palestine will manage to reconcile one faction with the other in the short term? What do you think the future holds for this nation? Will we see a fully independent state in the near future? Leave us your opinions here below in the comments. And if you liked this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already. That way, you won't miss any of the news that is coming soon. All the best, and see you next time.